if you were 18 again, what advice would you give to us? The biggest one would be don't be scared to be vulnerable. Because for years I had to have this facade of I'm a strong black woman. Um, I couldn't show anybody any any of my weaknesses. Um, I kept my own counsel. And that's what I carried through. And I think vulnerability was my, should have, you know, not should, but it was my biggest strength at the end because I asked for help, like proper help, like from the bottom of my heart, you know, not going through rehab and paying lip service and, you know, I know better, you know, I'll get out of this myself. I needed, I didn't really needed help, but it was actually funny enough guided to be the right help, which was the energy work. And maybe I was had to go through what I went through to 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 reach the point in the way it's energy work is it, is what's going to blast me off into you know wellness um so my my I would advise myself at the age of 18 would you know be you know if you could have been more vulnerable and ask for that help welcome to the daily soul bias show I am your host Paula Abdul and this is a show where we invite guest authors coaches and entrepreneurs to share their insights for the expansion of collective consciousness. And today I have a very, very special guest. Just here on my side of the pond in Leeds in the UK. Welcome to the show, Olubumi Abuaba. Welcome. Thank you so much, Bola. Thank you for having me on. It is so nice to have you. You're the first Nigerian on my show. Really Yay! beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to read out your profile, just a bit of your profile before we start, a bit of your bio. Olubumi Abuaba is a recovery enhancement consultant specializing in energy stacking for sustainable addiction recovery. Dr. Olubumi is a wonderfully magnetic, warm and confident woman, a skilled healer, with mastery over various globally acclaimed healing techniques, including the dynamic art of future life progression and bioresonance, by exquisitely weaving together the healing modalities all backed by science, she has created an exclusive and powerful experience that's bespoke and personal to each client. That is so powerful. I love that you are really specializing in yeah. sustainable addiction recovery based on your own experience. Yeah. Your own, that makes a big difference. I it would does. love to know, I'd love to know how you came to this place of not only recovering, but also now supporting and teaching recovery addiction. Oh, thank you. It, it began in, yeah, the, the turning point was 2008 and the Queen, Queen Elizabeth called one of her years, uh, her Anna Cerebralis. That's when everyone was getting divorced in the family. Everything was going wrong. So I coined that term Anna Cerebralis, my most horrible year, but it was the best year. It was the worst year. It was the best year. And that was 2008. And what preceded that were years and years of really playing Russian roulette with my, my health with addiction. And it was alcohol. That was my, my, my addiction was alcohol. Cause at school I'd got bullied an awful lot. Um, I didn't have many friends. I dreaded going to school. So there was a lot of fear around school interaction with people. And so that drink was almost like I felt confident. It was like that Dutch courage. And even though I didn't start drinking at, at, at early age, it was always in my head that that was alcohol was my best friend, that any chance I got to have a little bit of pocket money as I was studying, I would have that little drink um, as a celebration or to feel confident if I went to a party when I got older and my dad allowed me to go. You know, I do Nigerian fathers. <laughs> You know, so when I could actually go out and socialize, I knew I needed that drink to kind of change the way I felt. So I didn't feel that crippling anxiety, that social anxiety, that feeling of just feeling lost, really. Um, 
And so that was really interesting. So for, for many, many years, it just carried on like that and it was in control. But then with life events and big events like going to university again, that was another big hurdle for me. Um, again, the only black student in my, in my, in my, in the dental school, basically, I was the only black student, um, which is, thank God it's changed. There's so many more Africans and, you know, West Indians in, in going through and Indians, et cetera. But yeah, I was like kind of the, the pioneer really. I was one of the first. So for me, again, just feeling alienated and I, I changed the way I felt with alcohol. I actually didn't like the way, you know, I didn't like, I didn't get it to get drunk. I, I drank to change. I didn't even like the taste of alcohol, but I just wanted to change the way I felt and that did it. So it became this confident person on the outside and I felt confident in the inside just for that little bit of time so the inside and the outside matched um but most days there was that kind of fear and impending doom and you know something's going to happen to me and you know there's always that just crippling kind of nervousness anxiety kind of living on a state of high alert which you know and I know where that came from and uh, so alcohol just really was my, you know, my crutch really for many, many years. And then I was what you classically call today the high functioning alcoholic. Um, you know, I was doing really well, et cetera. But there was always that little hidden thing that, you know, I'd never go into the pub or anything like that. I was drinking, I was a secret drinker, you know, and I could hold it. Um, but yeah, the, the wheels came off. Alcohol is a very insidious thing. You need more and more of it to get the same effect. So I was drinking more and more to feel that difference, to feel like myself. And, and that's how it kind of progressed. And a friend of mine said, look, go and see this, this lady. She's a shaman. And I laughed because you know, I'm a scientist, you know, I'm from a science background. I'd never heard of any of this before. And I went, well, what's she going to do? I mean, you know, I kind of laughed really, but it was the thought of my doctor saying, you need to go on antidepressants. And I just knew if I go on antidepressants, I'm not going to get off them. And so I thought, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go down that medical, you know, the Prozac route, the you know, antidepressant route. So I said, you know what? I'm going to give her a try. I will try. I will just keep an open mind and I'll go. And um, I did chuckle a little bit. Um, but when I went to see her, she's my best friend today. But when I went to see her, I didn't know what she'd done. She just lay down and asked me what my problem was. And I had kind of cried a bit. And I just said, look, I, I just don't know how to get out of this hole. I know that it's going to be, this is the end if I can't, you know, try and um, get some level of sobriety and, and keep it going. For, 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 and for good is, is the wrong thing to say, but we always say a day at a time, but I just knew I had to stay stopped. So she proceeded to do, I kind of fell asleep on her couch and she proceeded to do whatever she did. I just remember things being plumped on me and hands all over me and you know, kind of incense and everything else. And I kind of walked out that first session lighter, just kind of perceptible shift, a little bit shift. And I thought, well, this feels quite good. Um, so I went back a two or three more times to see her. And I now knew she'd done Reiki and she'd used crystals, etc. And she was doing her, you know, a shaman um, kind of rituals. And I knew something was working. This is a cam up, absolute skeptic that walked through that door the first time, but I knew it was working because I had all these consequences to face. So divorce papers were served in rehab, uh, custody of my children. Well, I've had to fight for that. Um, drink driving. It was, it was a whole host of problems, career in, in, you know, in trouble. It was just a whole mess. Going through those sessions, I knew I was going to be okay. I just knew I was going to, whatever happens, I knew I was going to be all right. And that was a feeling that I'd never had before. And I'd never, I didn't feel scared. I felt like something's protecting me. I feel protected and I felt safe. And I knew I was going to be all right. That's it. I can't tell you. It was Everything was coming at me. 
but I knew I was going to be fine. It's almost like it was going past me, going around me, you know, um, and I could deal with it. Um, so I was just hungry to know more. I wanted to know what, what is this? Because I don't, I'm not getting any of this. Why is it, is it just in my head? Is it whatever? Um, but I was starting to feel a lot better in myself, more sense of peace, kind of more in my body. You know, I was more, yeah, around me. I was not in my head all the time. Um, and this, this level, underlying level of certainty, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine. Um, and I thought crystals, how on earth can crystals help? I mean, they're just, I just saw them as trinkets on your jewelry and, you know, then I looked into the science because I like to see the science behind things. So what is, the, what is the science behind crystals? And a lot of people say it's all a bit pseudo, but for me, if we're surrounded by crystals, we've got crystals in technology, you know, we've got the liquid crystal display, our kind of LCD screen, we've got silicon chips, we've got crystal quartz in our, you know, quartz in our watches, we've got rubies in, in the laser that in the medical profession we've got galena and pyrite in radios we've got we are surrounded by crystals that power our technology and i thought what if it's powering our technology and it's a very stable structure that emits stable energy that kind of synchronizes and, and resyncs you know energy fields it must be doing that to us and that's how i saw it i just saw the analogy of sort of kind of you know it's in it's in technology and it's working so why is it not working on you know us it must be then you look back into ancient times and you go back to africa with you know gemstones and used in rituals and china and egypt and you know everywhere you look crystals were used for healing you know and india so all these countries can't be wrong <laughs> you know this can't just be woo you know this <clears throat> you know we're seeing it right through civilizations that for instance crystals were used so i was like whoa okay so for me it kind of locked together do you know what i mean the science and the spirituality kind of all connected it's like um you know it's like a safe you know a safe when you're kind of doing the combinations and trying to get it right. And I was trying to work out why, 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 why. And it was the science that kind of, kind of was the last two digits of the thing to open up the thing. And all of a sudden it was, that's it. There it is. That's it. And, um, click by click it opened. And it's like, I understand now why, you know, these, these, these beautiful, beautiful, colored crystals work and then reiki you know and we're talking about life force that we are we're all connected our life force runs through us and if it's incoherent if it's disrupted then it affects our emotional our mental our physical selves and that made sense as well you know we are electric we are electric magnetic field so crystals can interact with our electromagnetic field and resync it and i can see why reiki works so looking at all of this i started to believe that it's all about energy and that with addiction it's i mean a lot of people might disagree with me kind of in the recovery world but you know i'm standing strong that it is an energetic disruption mm. that you know if my energy feels disrupted you know, we are more likely to obviously experience stress, addiction, um, burnout. Um, so it's an energetic disruption and alcohol addiction blows holes in our energy fields. I've spoke to a kinesiologist that it blows holes in our energy fields. We are more prone, you know, to other people's emotions, to events, etc. So it all just started to make sense. Really appreciate you sharing journey with us and how you have come to see all these modalities all these permission slips as a way of life a way of being to yeah. stay connected to that true self to that life force within us i also had an interesting um discovery of energy healing with my son my first son um at, um lives with autism and um quite severe learning difficulties as well mm. And he has, um, being the one that has really um, 
helped me to stay connected to energy healing because I tried everything else, but he would not sleep in room. He mm. would just struggle to get himself regulated. Um, and my brother, who was uh, my younger brother, who was well into Reiki before I was, kept telling me about Reiki. And I kept saying, because we were raised Christians, and I kept saying to him, no, I'm not interested in him. But I got desperate. And I love it when you said that as well, that you were resistant. You did not really believe in it. And that's okay, because we've mm. all been conditioned. Yeah, absolutely. And the, it gets to a point, it's about what is the limit? What is it going to take for you to awaken, for you to be open-minded, to try whatever it is that is going to give you that freedom, that is yeah. going to expand your consciousness? Because we are all consciousness. We are all life force. But sometimes we have blocked meridians within us. Yeah. And we come to a place where we are desperate enough to try just about anything that is beyond our normal go-to. Mm. And that is what Reiki was for me as well. And I began to um, allow Reiki energy healers to, to leave him Reiki from a distance. And then I began to, when I saw the difference it made in his life, I began to visit Reiki practitioner myself. And then I trained up in 2016. And so I am also a Reiki practitioner. And I love the way it really expands the energy meridian within us effortless. Yeah. Effortless. And then looking at... For instance, the power of our thoughts, you know, the power of our words, that carries an energy. You know, we look at Dr. Emoto, who studied the power of word over water, that, you know, as you know, when you speak badly, you know, the crystals, the actual molecules, the water molecules all kind of crunched up. When he spoke beautifully to the other glass of water, it flowered. I thought the way we speak to ourselves is so important. So the energy of words is so important what how we speak to ourselves how we speak to others you know being just be not overly careful but words are very powerful you know and you can you can cripple yourself with words so i started to learn not to be so critical on myself be more loving with myself was i was my worst critic you know if someone's going to crucify me on the cross i would have done it myself no one else would do it, it would be me so it all kind of came together bit by bit and then looking at all sorts of other things as, you know, we're talking about thoughts and words and mantras and meditation. And that was just absolutely amazing. Food, you know, food carries an energy, you know, they affect our chakras, you know, different foods to check our, our chakra balance. If we're eating ultra processed foods, you know, our vibration goes down, you know, that's been you know, recorded the energy of food, of whole foods, the processed food. Again, the energy of food's important. Food is medicine. The energy of herbs, the vibration they carry is one of the highest vibration. So for me, it was also getting back to ancestral and, you know, herbs. We use herbs a lot in our cooking and in medicine. So looking into that was really, for me, again, it's going back to my heritage and then we're looking at, you know, ancestral healing, you know. And that to me was kind of the most important combination for me for it to finally go, wow, I know where I am now. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it was interesting. You know, my parents have got lots and lots and hundreds of pictures in the house. There's there's lots of pictures of our family back from generations in the living room. And it was, I think I must have been guided to see this one particular picture. And and I said to my dad, who's that? And it was a, a old black and white picture, sepia coloured picture of a, a man, very striking, in his agbada, you know, his um, gown with a staff sat there. And it must have been taken in either early 1900s, something like that, and very striking. And I'd never seen that picture before. And it was interesting how I saw it that particular day. And I said to my dad, who's this man? And he said, he's your great grandfather. And I said, oh, we haven't talked about him. He said he was enslaved. He was captured 
in slavery and sent to America, but he returned. So he managed to either, I don't know the story, I'm going to find out more, but he either was, it was freed, maybe it was the end of slavery, about the 1850s maybe, um, so I think it was freedom then, emancipation, or he escaped and he found his way back to a Bayakuta, remembered his name, traded in cattle along the way, so he was a, a cattleman, Baba Lella on the call him, father of cows, and he traded all the way back, I think it was Sierra Leone, Liberia, Sierra Leone, all the way back to Nigeria, to Abeokuta, where he married my grandmother. And I looked at that picture and I cried. I cried because he was my North Star. He found his way home. Under all that adversity, all the trauma he must have gone through, he found his way home. He remembered who he was and he found his way home and he carried on. And for me, that was, he, I found that picture. I needed that picture and his story to make me find my way home to me. And that's what addiction did. It took me away from who I truly was. You know, I remembered my name. You know, I was very ashamed of my name uh, for a long time, you know, because you know, they would laugh at my name, they would make fun of it. I was very ashamed of my colour because I was the only black kid in a white school. And it all came flooding back and it was like, I am so proud of who I am. Um, you know, my grandfather, great-grandfather fought his way home. His resilience, you know, in the face of all of that is just breathtaking. And to set up a successful, you know, you know business at the end of that and to sit in a picture where it must have cost a lot of money to take this picture in those days and I just thought he is he's my hero and I remember my name and I'm proud of my name it's Olubumi I would never have called myself that I would have called myself Jane if I could have done at the time but for my full name you know I know who I am I know where I'm 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 from you know and I'm so proud of that and that was when it, that was a final it, that was the piece de la resistance that final bit of here I am that's me and it's a result of all my ancestors fighting to get where they need to get to, you know, that's why I'm here today. And he's part of me. He's in my genetics. And that's when I started again. This is my scienty brain going, hmm, hmm, let's have a look at genetics and ancestral healing. Because that's your DNA, isn't it? Your epigenetics. So when you look at your DNA, my DNA would probably have a strand of his trauma in my genetic profile so every time someone in the family the ancestral line has a trauma whether it's holocaust slavery war whatever that's tagged in the dna in your dna so there were stories that i realized that weren't mine were his stories and i always remembered feeling that feeling of being hunted and a feeling it was like always having a look at my shoulder, always looking over my shoulder, like who's there. It was almost like I was in a state of high alert. You know, the minute I kind of opened the door to 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 get out into the world, it was like someone's out to get me. And I never ever knew where that came from. It was just there. And I understood then and there that is where this came from. In his slavery days he must have had the same feeling and I was experiencing that trauma when I was going to school. That's when it was triggered. It's like, I feel like I'm, I feel hunted and that's where I must have got that from. So again, going through clearing my ancestral line, you know, acknowledging my history, that it's part of who I am and making peace with that and and celebrating my ancestors you know that's again is where i got into the ancestral healing and helping people with ancestral awakening ancestral clearing um and so that's that's where i am um
So I've 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 wound all those. I've blended them all, you know, and certain people may need certain things. Somebody might need other things. But I think energy healing is also deeper than just the surface, you know, your life force. It's going back into your generations and, and clearing all that. Because, again, you know, some of these stories that aren't yours can weigh you down and you think it's yours, you know, and it can cause, again, if you're – prone addiction burnout stress depression anxiety um so it's always important to kind of really be thorough and then into bioresonance again that's um kind of an in innovative science and I, again i latched onto that because it just made perfect sense to be able to work with the cutting edge part of this which helps with frequency and mm. helps with our frequency and be able to use that and be able to scan and diagnose as well because it can diagnose kind of eastern western you know it can diagnose all of that so for me it just makes perfect sense it just made perfect mm. sense to blend everything together because i love the scientific part of that and i love the ancient healing and the two both make perfect sense together so that's where that's where i am and so i kind of move forward and you know, want to help people like myself who I really identify with struggling with addiction and burnout and feeling like they don't belong and and feeling isolated and, and getting their self-worth back and their self-compassion back and then understanding themselves. And that's another thing with energy healing that you, you get to a point where you're so comfortable in yourself and you trust yourself so much. The world recognises the real you. Do you know what I mean? The universe recognizes you for who you are. The world does. People do. You don't have to kind of try. Do you know what I mean? You just, you can just be yourself. And that's what so long I just couldn't be myself, you know. And today I'm just so blessed that I can be myself. And, you know, I'm feel, I feel very fortunate for that. And I love what you said about what you um, were looking for when you started to drink and I know that what we all want is love. when we are in a place where we feel desolate and we've all had to had to go through some kind of trip. so I really thank you for sharing yours because sometimes we need to hear these stories in order for us to really embrace what we have taken on as our own theme, because we all have our things. And so for some of us, um, it's, it's, you know, it's always a combination of things because they always say trouble comes in, you know, in a group, you know, with company, you know, misery likes company. Um, and it's never just the one thing. It's always a mixture of things. And it's about how much do we take on before we awake to our yeah. truth. Some of us need less than others, and it's a very individual. And, our, and we know that the reflections we're seeing around us comes from our state of essence. The law of attraction is always spoken of that, how we are attracting the experiences we are having. We are attracting based on the essence of our being, mm -hmm. based on the intentions that we're holding. Mm. I always say we're starting from where we are, and each journey is different. Yeah. And being vulnerable is so key because it allows us to give that ego a pause, give that ego trip a pause, mm. because the ego feels it knows it all. The ego yeah. is riding on survival. The ego is riding on fear, and it's not going to show. The world doesn't encourage you. To show that you are, you are unknown. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't encourage you to show that you feel alone, mm -hmm. even though you you know that being alone is a strength because you could be with so many people but still feel lonely. Yeah. But we, when we own that aloneness, we know that there is actually a force in you. We know that we have beings guiding us through our spiritual practice and we are less inclined to want to atone to what the world, to what the world we have created 
Mm. Is this reality is what we have created. We are yeah. less inclined to feel like a victim to the world That's when we absolutely. own that aloneness, when we own that power within us. Mm. So I, and we can only do that when we have become vulnerable, when we have stopped, when we have paused, because our spiritual practice, the awakening we seek requires us to pause. Yeah. You have to pause that journey, that race, that rat race, that fast race, that monkey man. We have to pause it to actually go within and discover mm -hmm. that power. Within. But I also have another question for you, just to because I, I and sometimes want I was going to say if you don't pause, you will be stopped. <laughs> yes, and sometimes I, I, I do. There has to be a very conscious pause because we can get stopped, and we still keep digging, keep we still keep digging, and we. For some of us, we pause quicker than others. Mm -hmm. And um, until we come, because the, the spiritual practice is a, is, is a dedicated practice of habits. We have to gain new habits and we have to be really passionate about it because we're going from negative to positive and we have to seek that positivity with a passion, yeah. with a zero tolerance. We cannot I like that. Before we can get to that neutral space, which is where the higher self dwells in, that space consciousness. Mm. So it takes a while for us, because sometimes we go to a new habit, to have our morning routines, to have our afternoon routines, to have the nighttime routines that keep us in that space of higher self. Because the higher self is really what drives us in our spiritual practice, in our, yeah. in our fourth density lifestyle. Mm -hmm. so I would love to know what your morning. My morning routine. I normally start at five o'clock. Um, so and it's nice in the summer, but I normally start at five. And the minute I open my eyes, because before I used to open my eyes and all the negative thoughts come in, racing in and the day and everything else is like, oh, God, what I've got to face today. And I think through my spiritual practice now, I can kind of wake up and yeah talk about you know i'm just grateful for my bed i'm grateful for a great night's sleep etc and then i will i don't get out of bed for about half an hour but then i'll put on some earphones and do 20 minute breath work so get me make sure that i'm the parasympathetic for the day <laughs> mm -hmm. so i kind of do my breath work um so about, about half past five or quarter to six i'm kind of up I, again I sit on my bed, so it's really much, it's a bed routine, <laughs> you know, and I get my crystal for grounding, shungite at the moment, I kind of change crystals depending on, but I use shungite, I put it between my feet, you know, bare feet on the floor, pretend it's on the grass, ground myself, and I probably do about 20 minutes meditation, um, and I call in my guides, my council, ascended masters, um so i do that i kind of put a bubble around myself for the day bubble of protection i kind of do that um build a shield bringing whatever crystals into my vibration um and just make sure you know there's protection there i feel clear um but yeah i do that i also use tuning forks tone toning forks tuning forks um so that's my kind of signal when i finish that you know that ritual for the morning is over but i will talk to my guys right through the day um but yeah i kind of use um my toning crystal uh, my toning my toning forks um and i use my little beads as well so i kind of do a little mantra um sort of the ganesh one clearing the way for the day um and then i'm on my way i do a little bit of tapping so it depends each day i mean i have that as a definite but sometimes i do a lot of tapping as well and just making sure you know energy's flowing nicely kind of bless the house bless the area bless you know make sure i kind of bless ahead of the day that my blessings to anybody that i see hear about read about who think about me who i think about i'll make sure i bless that everyone um the you know bless my my office I, I just bless everything i bless the minute i get into the taxi for instance i bless the taxi driver so that's very much kind of just been very conscious and very aware of yeah. sending that love out you know to the everybody any walls out there I send blessings you know any 
people that are in trouble that I kind of immediately know about, I bless them. Um, and then it's very much a kind of, you know, a lot still keep my energies running. So I kind of, kind of grounding energy. So for instance, I kind of visualize a cord running from my root chakra into the earth. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming back through the earth, through my feet. So there's that root chakra energy running. And then I have my, the rest of the chakras running. So from, you know, above down kind of my spine up. So I always make sure I do that in the morning and I kind of check in on that, that it's running and my energy is still running. Okay. Um, and boundaries as well, very much and very much boundaries, making sure my boundaries are kind of soft and permeable enough to let people in. But, you know, it's as far as it goes sometimes. It depends who I'm with. Um, so, yeah, but that's come through, you know, that's come over time. Mm -hmm. You know, and these are things I do automatically. It's not something that I would have done altogether. It's just bit by bit. I kind of added a bit. I kind of stacked it um, through the day. And then I'll, you know, lunchtime, I'll go for a walk and just get that grounding again, get that air, fresh air in the park. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm just all about just through the day, I'm just aware, you know, and conscious and, you know, making sure that people have their say and, you know, being understanding, you know, trying to kind of switch off my analyzer, my judgment head, if there's any events that I think would be triggering, I kind of go through that in the morning and I just kind of see it as coming out okay. The outcome's going to be fine. Um, and I kind of just like do a little prayer on it that, you know, it's going to be okay today. And, and usually it is. And it's not because the event's any different than what I expect it to be, but my reaction and how I look at it is different. Um, so that kind of really takes a lot, the edge of, of a lot of things. And it can also change the way things work out. <laughs> yeah um very powerful it kind of alters your reality doesn't it? it kind of just alters it, it alters your reality you kind of bend reality with it and it's um, it's almost like it expands time <laughs> yeah so and i can get that fast done and some someone may say thank you thank you for sharing that because someone may say that do i need to do so much to um set myself up to align myself to my perspective that's really what my book is about. I wrote a book called Daily Soul for an inspired life. And it's about higher perspectives, about how we have the physical ego self, which has its own conditioned perspectives, and the higher self, which is the higher perspectives of compassion, of, of resonance, of resilience. These are higher perspectives which the ego doesn't have. The ego is all of survival mm. and fear. So this, someone may say, why do I need to do so much in the morning or in the day? Because we do not realize the amount of conditioning that is there in the exterior. And it's about increasing the level, our frequency of vibration, the frequency that our cells and atoms are vibrating at. But we have been conditioned from a very young age, from, from baby, from, our, from, from, from being born by things we see and the things we cannot see, people will see and the, and, and the beings we cannot see have been conditioning us to stay in that third density in fear. We do not realize how much of this is endemic within us. It's ongoing. It happens and it's increasing because as we are expanding, there is a need for the technologies that are used to enslaved and come to also advance. So we are being asked to really not joke, to really take this reconditioning, wiring, reprogramming very seriously. So the habits we have are very key. We need to become more aware. Yeah. Of the need to keep healing the layers, healing the layers. Because even as we do the morning habits on a Monday, it has to happen on a Tuesday, it has to happen <laughs> on a Wednesday, because the programming is ongoing, programming mm. that is not allowing us to expand, expand in love, to know who we truly are. So really, I appreciate you sharing that because it's inspirational. I also have my morning routines. So what is your routine? Mantras. Yeah. I have my mantras, I have my book, my daily soul bites book, because what this does, it, it, uh, it reminds me 
all our routine, because we all have different permission slips. I have my smoothies, which give me a sense of well-being. I also have a number of crystals I use. My mantras are big, though. I have a number of mantras as well as my meditation, which allows me to step into space consciousness. It's from this space I can receive intuition, wisdom, to set my intentions for the day. Yeah. So it's really about choosing whatever permissions, whatever modality, whatever comes to us. It is easy. It could be on our phones. It could be a toolkit that we got That's right. on someone's yeah. show. And it's really important for us to um, own this and not to compare what feels right. That's what feels right. Like what feels good. May not feel right um, tomorrow. Mm. Being flexible. Yeah. Being conscious of how we feel. So I do, I do love um, you sharing your 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 morning um, with us. How but I think you're right. That time? I think, but I think that's that's what I was also going to say to your listeners is that <clears throat> you know it's something that evolves over time and it might change and that's fine. As you've just said, it's it's fine to change. And I used to worry like, oh, gosh, I've gone off these crystals or, you know, I'm not using crystals. For, I've not been using crystals for the last few days or whatever. It doesn't matter. I was doing something else that I was guided to do. Um, so it is following that intuition and not being and scared to follow that to intuition. It. And you'll, yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. You may come back but to it or not. And that's it. Not, yeah. not to be scared with going with the flow. You know, you, you're... If, if you're feeling dead to kind of not using crystals or tapping or you're doing something else, then that's fine. You know, as long as you're doing something, just keep clear, keep energizing, keep protecting, you know, and expanding. That's good. But as you said, it's, it is, I think it's something that we, gosh, if we could teach this at school. <laughs> yeah. And it's happening. Primary school. It's happening. It's happening. We are, um, I'm jumping into timelines where I'm seeing a difference in the way our children are being educated. And mm. this is the way to go. Yeah. Because it's not about regurgitating facts that do not mean anything to us, that do not have any relevance to our well being mm. or turning us into slaves of mm. the actual institutions. But this is about us really resonating with who we truly are. And yeah. seeing the world as one, as opposed to separateness. Um, so I would love to know how you work with your clients. <clears throat> I work with them usually kind of, in, um, I initially start with seeing them, <clears throat> physically seeing them. So it's not an online thing initially. Okay. That it's usually kind of a VIP morning or a day session. So I have a consultation with them, an energy assessment. Um, that could take up to about two hours. Um, and then from there, I kind of do, it's like a consultancy, really. Um, and then I, I wouldn't even say a coach, a kind of guide, a mentor, but then I start working with what I think is going to be good for them. <clears throat> so we kind of go through some healing sessions with bioresonance is the underlying thing that I do use, um, along with kind of energy stacking, which we've just talked about that, you know, in the morning I might do this. And so I kind of guide the clients into using, implementing the energy sort of techniques, um, depending on, you know, the situation where they're at and starting to build over a period of weeks, kind of their routine and making sure that they they're comfortable with it, that it's it's kind of yielding some good results, that they're starting to feel those changes. Um, but I will go and see and have a consultation, either go to their home um, or they come to me and we'll probably spend the morning or an afternoon or a whole whole VIP day kind of doing the bioresonance, maybe doing some future life progression. So it's in stages, like as you say, it's like peeling an onion, isn't it? You know, and, but making sure it's baby steps that they're getting used to being enjoying using the energy techniques um to work through through the day through the weeks and that they get comfortable with it and as you say they can change at any time so i work with people one-to-one -one, and then after a while you know we'll be just doing online going through techniques what's what's stopping them through the day what's keeping them stuck in their recovery you know what's not moving forward 
Um, and so it's bespoke to what that, that situation is. Um, so I kind of, I'm not very prescriptive. I kind of see what the person <laughs> needs at the time and, and go through it that way. That's wonderful. And where can people find you when they want to connect with you? Um, I'm at the moment, my website is not up, but I am on LinkedIn, social media. I think you've got the links anyway, social media, yes. um, Instagram, and I'm going to be on YouTube. I've got a little series coming out, um, yes. in the next six weeks. Yeah. Um, about the modalities, the recovery codes, um, which are the modalities that I use within my, uh, um, system. What's your YouTube channel going to be called? Not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's all at the moment. It's all in the works. It's all. I'm mostly on LinkedIn, and you can contact me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm mostly at, or Instagram, Doctor Ola Bumi, Um But yeah, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me, Doctor. Oh, Uli. you're very welcome, and thank you for inviting me on your show, Bola. It's been really enjoyable, and it's nice to see two Nigerians. <laughs> I love it. In the energy world. So, yeah. And I'll definitely come down and see you when, when I'm in London. I would love that. That would be great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I would like to thank my audience for joining me today and invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Bola Bimbola Official Daily Soul by Show. Also on Spotify, on Apple on Amazon, on so many platforms, wherever you listen to your podcast, and grab my copy of daily, your copy of the Daily Soul Finds book and visit Dr. Ulubumi Abwaba's LinkedIn page and contact her to really get that energy stack in to form the new habits that really will awaken the consciousness. This is the conscious awareness that we need to create the lives that we deserve. So I really encourage you to, to connect with Dr. Olubumi on LinkedIn. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Daily Soul Buys show. Bye.